Let me just read a few verses from God's word and then we'll stand very quickly for a moment's prayer. I just want to read from Matthew chapter 11 and I'm going to read the last three verses. Matthew chapter 11 verse 28. Come unto me, all ye that labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. And ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let's just stand very briefly for a moment's prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank thee for the testimony that we've heard tonight. And we bless thee, O God, for saving Matthew. We thank thee for the application that he's applied in sharing his testimony in the gospel. And we thank thee for gospel truth and gospel light. We thank thee, O God, that by the Holy Spirit thou art able to use thy word, even in this meeting, to draw sinners to thyself. Thou art able to use thy word to encourage our hearts to pray on. For we stand in need of household salvation. We think of many young people that have grown up in the free church. And, and oh God, not in apostate churches, but in the free church. And oh God, tonight are far from the Saviour. And oh God, in their sin and the state of misery, we cry unto thee that you'll remember them. And we pray that you'll bring to their hearts and minds the greatest invitation of all. We just pray now in the closing minutes of the meeting that thou will shut us in with thyself, that thou will bless us tonight, that thou will do us good, and that thou will encourage and instruct our hearts. May we see Christ afresh for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Now my text tonight is Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, and my subject is entitled Christ's great invitation to rest. Now this of course is one of the best known and most loved passages in the New Testament. Here is Christ's final words. He is speaking to those who are burdened with sin and in a state of misery. And to them he issues this very strong invitation and appeal. To those who come to him. They are given one of the most precious promises in the whole of the word of God. I will give you rest. That is, they can enjoy true and pure gospel rest here and now. They can have rest for their souls now. They can have true rest in the midst of the pressures and problems of life. And that they can find rest that will stretch into eternity to come. Rest that will bring them into heaven itself. Now, there's three things that I have here, and I normally preach for 25 or 30 minutes, and I'm not going to do that. I'm conscious of the time. But just look at the text. Think, first of all, of the people addressed in this invitation. All ye that labor and are heavy laden. Notice the terms. Very intense and strong language. Labor has to do with hard work. Work that leads to weariness, almost bringing you to the point of exhaustion, where you're, you're tired. I used to visit uh, Wesley and Joan Adams down the Creevy Road, and Wesley's house had a sign outside called Ockham Tired. I remember had a, a, a cousin come in. I was only a wee boy in short trousers. This lady was in her 30s. I was being brought up with my aunt because my mother and father were dead and my aunt had just come in from a very hard day's work and cleaning at the office. She was in her 50s and this uh, younger uh, cousin, she was complaining to my aunt that she was tired. And I remember my aunt saying to her, well, if you're tired, daughter dear, it's a pity o' your old mother. And you see, there is a weariness that comes to the body. And if you keep on working physically, at a point in time, you'll become drained. And, and you can't feel that you can do anything else but drag yourself off to bed and get some sleep. Uh, Dr. Paisley, of course, the late Dr. Paisley used to talk about having a cat nap. So, so that's the thought of labor. You, you're at the point of exhaustion. Uh, think of the words, heavy laden, bearing a burden. Bowed down beneath a load, a, a, an intolerable weight, where you have no 
ease, where you're not at peace, where you feel you're under a great strain. And these words, this intense language, describes and depicts the life of everyone who is without Jesus Christ tonight. The Bible, of course, tells us that the way of the transgressor is hard. King Solomon said in Proverbs 14 and 9 that fools make a mock of sin. And is not true tonight in our community and in the country. Sin is harmless. Young people are... Uh, as to them, sin's a laughing matter. It's nothing to be concerned about, whether it's drugs and drink or the nightclub or whatever. Uh, people, young or old, doing their own thing. To them, it's no big deal. And yet the Bible says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord have laid in him the iniquity of us all. Jeremiah said, Jeremiah 17 and 9, the heart is deceitful and above all things desperately wicked. Who can know it? And the realization that without Christ, every unsaved person has a monster within, the monster of sin. Sin is deceitful. Sin is deceptive. Sin promises so much. And yet, as we've heard in the testimony, costs you more than you want to pay, takes you further than you want to go, and brings you into a state of misery. I think of the catechism question 17 into what a state did the fall bring mankind? And the answer is the fall brought mankind into a state of sin and misery. You see, that's a consequence of Adam's fall and us and Adam into sin. All men are born now sinful. Born with a bias against God. But they're also born not only in a sinful condition, but an unhappy condition. And you know, even the rich, the millionaires and the billionaires, there's an unhappiness about their lifestyle. Sin involves a burden. There's a guilt attached to it. Remember, sin is breaking God's law. It's a transgression of the law. And sin brings us into a state of unhappiness, restlessness, hopelessness and joylessness. It's like a troubled sea. There's no peace. There's no true rest. And when Adam sinned, he was left in a state of fear. Sin robbed him of peace. He, he became empty and dissatisfied. He was robbed of fellowship with God. He lost original righteousness. He was robbed of joy. He was afraid now. And the relationship with God was affected. The relationship with his wife also became affected. He fell out with Eve. He, there was a division. They were at odds. He, he blamed her. There was rows, there was accusations. The life is now shallow without the Saviour. You see, he plunged himself through disobedience into a state of sin and misery. And what's true for Adam is true of sinners today. How many lived their life under a cloud of guilt and misery and unhappiness? The curse of the heavy burden. The cause of the heavy burden traced to sin. And of course, boys, girls, young people, thorns, thistles, they're evidence of sin. The Bible talks about man earning his bread by the sweat of his brows, thinking about hard work. The whole of creation has been affected because of sin. And what is the cause of all our burdens today across the world? Here's the answer, sin. The sad reality is that man by himself has no ability or power to lift off or lighten his burden of sin. Even the people of God at times carry the burden of sin. They find themselves through circumstances in a state of misery. They labour under a load. And they can't lift it off. And they can't seem to lighten it. They labour under a cloud of guilt. They know they've sinned against the Lord. And against his law in thought and word and deed. They, they know that they've sinned in themselves. They've sinned against others. And they can do nothing to remove that burden. By themselves. Maybe they feel there's no hope for me. There's no help for me. There's no healing for me. I want to tell you it's not true. Think of the people addressed. All ye that labour and are heavy laden. Is that a picture of you tonight? In an unhappy, miserable state with the guilt of sin? Notice something else very quickly here. The precious announcement in the invitation. Come unto me. Underline those three words. You see, Christ stands with outstretched arms, with welcome hands, and he makes an announcement. And what does he say to sinners in this estate? 
Come unto me. And that's what he's saying tonight in this meeting. That's what he was saying through the, te the testimony. Notice the source of the announcement. Who is speaking? Who issues this free offer of the gospel? We can read it and reread it. Well, Christ is the source of it. Christ makes the announcement. Who makes out the invitation? Surely the worth and value of any invitation depends on the one who, who makes it. If I get an invitation from the Queen to Buckingham Palace, I would want to make sure it was exactly from the Queen and not somebody trying to fool me. We, we live in an immoral world, don't we? We live in an age of lying and deceit and cover-up. When men say one thing and mean another, isn't that true, sadly, of many politicians? It used to be that man's word was his bond, but it's not true today. Talk is cheap. Many make promises that they can't keep or have no intention of keeping. Just empty words. But here's a wonderful promise. And the source of it is Christ. And he says, come to me. And what will he do? I will give you rest. Who said that? It's Christ. And he is able to fulfill it. He is willing to fulfill it. He's the God-man. The context in verse 27 talks about the father and son relationship. And he's the eternal son of the everlasting father. He's the, the, the savior of the sinner. Notice that Christ is an interest in the salvation of the sinner. Christ is an interest in your soul right now in this meeting. Isn't that wonderful that Christ is an interest in your soul's salvation? Notice the strength of the announcement. We, we look at the context here. Verse 27, he says, All things are delivered unto me of my Father. That, that has to do with Christ's authority and power. There's a, a, a regalness of Christ's position. He, he's the eternal Son. He's the mediator of the new covenant. Here's the riches of Christ's power. He has just spoken of judgment. He's just spoken of certain cities uh, for whom it will be more tolerable in the day of judgment than other cities. He's shedding glorious light on this theme of light and the rejection of it and judgment to come. And these cities that had light and greater light are more accountable than other cities that are in darkness. And Christ has power and authority to sit on the throne of judgment. Given to him by his father. Because of who he is, the eternal son. Because of what he's accomplished. E e eternal salvation and redemption. He he's not a dead Christ tonight. He came to fulfill and do the father's will. E he's not a defeated saviour. His death on Calvary wasn't a mistake or a failure. Christ has been appointed by the father to this work. Christ has been accepted by the Father to do the work. He's been acclaimed and approved by the Father in his resurrection. He's the unfailing Christ. There's the strength of the promise. Note the sweetness of, of the announcement. It's directed to those bearing the guilt and burden of sin. What do they deserve? The wrath of God. The wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. And yet here is Christ, and he's calling out. He, he's, he, he's addressing these undeserving, uncaring, law-breaking sinners, guilty wretches who deserve judgment in hell, and he's calling them, come unto me. Isn't that a sweet thing? Remember Zacchaeus, the wee tax collector that was up the tree? He was up there to see Christ as he passed by. He was a thief. He was a despised little man. He had a heart full of sin. He was a greedy, selfish, covetous little soul. And Christ, what did he do? He didn't walk by. He stopped beneath the tree. And what did he say? Zacchaeus, come down. There was a personal call. He called out his name. And he says, today is salvation come to thy house. Today I must abide in thy house. Do you know, Christ is full of mercy to sinners. So often we're hard. And yet Christ is not. Christ is not hasty, rushing to judgment. Christ has got welcome arms, open hands, outstretched for sinners. Listen to this verse here in um, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 
Um, there, there's loads in it that we could say about it. But let, let's listen to these words. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. Corinthians, this is what you were like. But you're now washed. You're now sanctified. You're now justified in the name of the Lord Jesus. And by the Spirit of God. Those, those who are adulterers, those who are fornicators, those who are thieves, those who are murderers, those who are extortioners, those who are homosexuals, there's hope for them because they can be washed in the blood. They can be sanctified and set apart. They can be justified in the name of the Lord Jesus. You see, Christ is merciful. He's willing and able to save. Notice the spring of the announcement. Christ is willing and able to save. He can provide what he promised. He never disappoints. He is mighty and able to save. That's what Matthew told us. He is able and he is willing. It's no good if he's willing and not able. It's no good if he's able and not willing. But he was sent on a mission of mercy. He left heaven. He was born of the Virgin Mary, assumed a human body, lived a sinless life, suffered in our guilty room instead. On the tree, laid down his life sacrificially in atoning death, shed his precious blood, buried in the tomb, rose again from the dead, ascended to the right hand of the Father. And now all the merits of his blood sacrifice and not only have satisfied divine wrath and justice, but proclaim a message. Christ is able and willing to save. He's not unworthy. Do not doubt Christ's ability or power. He's not being dishonest. He's not unloving and uncaring. He's not mocking when he issues his announcement. His words are truth. Notice the simplicity of the announcement. Come unto me. Isn't that very simple? You see, let me finish with this. Religion, and the world's full of religion, isn't it? It's got a list of rules and regulations. A list of do's and don'ts. A list of go and do this and that. That's true of the Buddhist religion. It's true of the Muslim religion. It's true of Roman Catholicism. See, the Roman Catholics are told, go to the priest and confess your sin. They're told to do penance. They're told to go on a pilgrimage and other things. And they're informed if they complete certain things, they might at one stage do enough good works to enter into heaven. It's the same with the Muslim religion. Do good deeds, give alms, pray five times a day, go on a visit to Mecca. You see, as far as their salvation is concerned, it's do and don't. It's go and do, and, and go and do some more, and go and do enough that hopefully one day that you might be saved. And the vain hope is, I'll enter into heaven. But the true Christian religion is not rules and regulations. It's not go and do. Here's the head of the church, the son of God, the saviour of men. And what does he say? Come unto me. Not come to the church. Now it's good to attend church. It's not come to a good head understanding of the gospel, although you do need to give to mental assent to truth. It's not come to be a follower of me. It's, it's not come to ceremonies and to rules and regulations. It's not come to, to walk the aisle, raise a hand, sign a card. It's not come and read your Bible and say a few prayers and give you some money. It doesn't mean that. What does it mean? Let, let me put it this way as we finish. You've been very patient and I thank you for that. Come recognizing you're a sinner. Come that you need Christ to save you. Come repenting. Sorry enough to quit your sin. Hate and loathe it. Turn from it. Come and receive Christ. That's what faith is. Forsaking all I take him. And, and of course the individual who hears the words has the, the operation and the application of the work of the Holy Spirit. And that individual then is inclined to come and take and trust Christ. And he comes to Christ exclusively. Christ alone. Christ is accessible. Christ is approachable. Christ is available tonight. 
For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. As Matthew said, salvation in Acts 4 and 12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there's no other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Salvation is in Christ alone. And you come personally to him. Because only him can satisfy. It's only him that can do helpless sinners good. But I ask tonight in challenge, have you come? And there's a precious announcement. Come to me. And all the fullness of those words. There's a promise attached to the invitation. And I will give you rest. Now, now let me say this as we finish. He's saying if you come to me. I will give you something. Imagine getting an invitation for the queen. If you come to Buckingham Palace. I'm going to give a hundred thousand pounds for a carried up building fund. I'll be over in the morning. And if I haven't got the money, I'll go round each of you and get a few pounds for the flight. See, that's the thought here. Come to me and I will give you what? Rest. Attached to the, 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 the precious announcement is this promise. And it's all to do with satisfaction and security. True rest here and now. Rest in the Lord. There's many tonight of no rest and true peace because of sin in the world. Their hearts in a state of turmoil. They, they live with the guilt of their sin, past and present. It weighs upon them. It, it haunts them. Yet you tonight, if you come to Christ, you can enjoy this blessing. You can have peace with God. You can enter into a fellowship with him. You can enter into a relationship with him. And this peace will never be taken away. Because this peace doesn't depend on you. It depends on his finished work. It doesn't even depend on your circumstances and your situation. It depends on Christ. And Christ says, I will give you rest. And that's what he will do. A promise attached. There's more to the promise. But I'm going to leave it there. Have you got rest for your soul? Do you want rest? If you come to Christ, this promise can be yours.